Okay, hi everybody. I'm um, Liz Burney. I guess we'll get started now. I'm your host right now. I guess we're all we're a little bit concerned about the storms outside that we may lose power. So I don't know what to think that happens, but I'll try to um, have somebody turn, turn the hosting over to somebody else if that happens. Um, and today we are very fortunate to have <laughs> as our guest of honor, um, the author and rabbi uh, Moshe Weisblum speaking about this book, Ruth Talk, about the book of Ruth. And first of all, I want to thank everybody who uh, joined our book club uh, meeting last week, which was very successful. And uh, our, the, what we've adopted to uh, our sort of uh, method here is that we'll have the rabbi first speak about his book, um, some of the themes of it, whatever he'd like to speak about it for about 15 minutes, could be a little longer if he likes. And then we'll open it up to everybody's comments and questions. I had one comment that somebody sent me, uh, one question that somebody sent me in advance over the email, um, which I'll ask when we open that up. And I'd also like to ask everybody to stay uh, muted when um, you're not speaking. And when you have a question or comment to raise your hand, if you go on to the participants, um, you press the participants button at the bottom you'll see that there's a way to raise your hand and that'll keep everybody from um, speaking over each other and talking at once which will make it hard for people to, to hear and we just want to ask that everybody um, keep keep your it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be a question you can just make a comment but to try to keep it relatively short so that everybody has a chance everybody who's interested in speaking will have a chance to do that um, so Rabbi Weisblum um, please uh, please go ahead Okay, very good. Thank you, Liz. Uh, um, very happy Pesach and Bichol I uh, In my iPhone, I can't see everybody, but I assume that, uh, oh, here is Bunny. How are you doing? So good to see you. Um, okay, some of you I know. So hello, everyone. Um, so good to see all of you. And um, it's a kind of... Uh, Times it's hard not to say something uh, that not involved in politics or the situations, but um, I want to give a bigger for <laughs> everything, particularly the the part that you did for ZOA. I try also to help in uh, in all my connections and experiences, and hopefully that will lead. Um, all of us, and especially Israel in this scary situation, to better days. Um, so I have what ten minutes. Fifteen, Please? whatever you like, whatever you like. Fifteen. Okay. So, uh, so my name is Moshe Weisblum, and I'm in Long Island, New York. As you hear my accent, I'm from Israel, and 24 years in the United States as dual citizenship and. Uh, I served most of the years as a uh, community rabbi. I was five years in New Jersey, 15 years in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. And now I'm in Long Island, New York. Um, I wrote several books. One of them is a, is a small book, but carries, um, it's my favorite book because I'm totally subjective, but um, it's called Rootstock. And um, is a book that's dealing with the aspect of Book of Ruth um, in a different angle. Um, obviously, we have, many of us have in the back of our minds the regular uh, the regular commentators on the Book of Ruth. Um, some of us who are very familiar, Jews and non-Jews, are very familiar with the uh, biblical text and the different commentary but uh, with no doubt uh, between the story of King David and its um, descendants and um, the story of uh, the process of conversion and more, all based on the Book of Ruth. So what I try to do is to simplify the, um, the story of... Hello? Yeah, hi. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, to simplify the story of Ruth to um, to um, kind of very um, uh, short, um, I don't know if it's the right way to say collection, 
but very short um, base of the all the commentaries and um, application to our days. There is a concept that many colleagues and many people misconstrue, which is the tikkun olam. I think um, many of you, maybe all of you agree with me that um, there is a concept of tikkun olam that you hear constantly from different leaders who use and abuse um, in the wrong way. Some example is the BDS idea of tikkun olam, which obviously it's, it doesn't carry the real tikkun olam, which we meant. Uh, tikkun olam in the book of fruit is the idea of uh, transfer, uh, taking, transforming ourselves, helping those around us, and contributing to the uh, betterments of the world. Uh, and that's the, basically the heart of the book of fruit. And literally, we all know that Tikkun Olam is repairing the world, but based on the Rambam and uh, and the many other, it's the idea that um, a person can not sit idly and just see what's going on, but try actively to um, to make a difference. So um, the story of Ruth is the story of a person who was... Um, have all the convenience in the world. Um, obviously, she had, uh, she is, uh, uh, most of the rabbis agree that she was the daughter of the Moabite king and she had all the materialistic needs of this world. Yet, um, she went after her in law and really devoted herself to the ideal and something that um, many rabbis follow this concept of three times. Many rabbis ask the question like, how do you know the proper way of conversion? Uh, um, people come to, um, and they say that they want to be part of Jewish faith. Uh, I think Book of Food is the, is the springboard or the foundation because um, the way that Naomi, uh, based on the Talmud, that Naomi um, was back and forth with her and said to her, um, you know, it's a lot of challenges and it's involved with a lot of um, uh, bigotry and misunderstanding of, of what's happening with our people and more, and she insisted to follow her, it's not just a very kind of romantic um, uh, biblical story, it's a deep, uh, heartwarming message that um, give us a signal who is a real convert and, and what's the proper process of conversion. On one hand, not to impose too much difficulties. On the other hand, to give a person a hint over the challenges that he or she may have heard. Um, not only the subject of conversions came out of Book of Ruth, not only the idea of the King David dynasty and being the great, great son of Ruth, but also understanding a law of harvesting, the a law of the been caught the process of giving tithe in Judaism, uh, which the Islam misconstrued um, and the Christianity too, based on the Book of Ruth. Um, there is another concept I, I try to, to um, introduce, which is the concept of chart. I put in the book, I don't know how, how much you can see, it. I worked very hard to create a chart based on a lot of uh, rabbinic writings and this chart, uh, which is like two pages, it gives us the, um, the lineage or the comprehension of what transpired Ruth. Uh, and that's basically the last part of the book, which is the more Kabbalistic aspect of the story of Ruth. Um, one of the famous story of the Dalai Lama is the, uh, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, um, Someone wrote a book about it. But anyway, he um, invites um, not only the um, conservative reform orthodox rabbis, but also spiritual leaders of other faith. It was about a year that Dalai Lama invited all the big makers and big leaders from many different faith groups and asked them like, all kinds of common questions. To make long story short, he was very disappointed. The only one that brought him to some enlightenment or happiness was the the rabbi in the rest in peace i forgot his last name shlomi something in colorado in boulder colorado 
he was a renewal Kabbalistic rabbi that uh, explained the Dalai Lama more than the basic foundation of commandments and rules. There is also esoteric, there is a mystical part of Judaism. And when they dig in to talk about the juxtaposition between um, Jewish commandments and, uh, and uh, oh, thank you, Rabbi Zalman Shechter Shlomi. Thank you. So, um, uh, juxtaposition, I have the privilege to meet him twice and they invited me, invited me as a guest speaker in 98. But anyway, so he said to him, um, the Kabbalistic aspect, the esoteric aspect of the text and the transmigration of souls, that one of the core belief in Judaism, which uh, the Dalai Lama was not only very impressed, but he said, oh, now I understand why so many Israelis comes here because uh, the, you neglected uh, of teaching them the, um, the concept of transmigration and the understanding huge difference between uh, reincarnation uh, of um, Islam and Christianity and uh, transmigration of soul in Judaism and Buddhism that um, somehow connected. Um, one of the well-known Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of um, England statement um, is that um, people uh, misconstrue or misinterpret um, uh, the, the word of karma. He said that the right translation of the word karma is tikkun. And the idea is not the literalist that understand that the soul come back, etc. But it's something that connected to a spark of a past life uh, with the current life with a special, um, if you may use the word shlichut or mission that each individual uh, incurred. The difference is that the uh, Hinduism as well as Buddhism believe in uh, some type of um, connection that um, in our comprehension uh, versus Judaism that based on the Ruyanic and other teaching, it's not necessarily something that revealed to us. But back to the chart, uh, I think uh, that the chart can shed a, a light and understanding of the uh, story of Ruth and her tremendous need of tikkun olam, which means to go back to the source, which is the source of, of kindness to him, and, and, and go back to the house of Abraham, which means she came from the house of a kindness, because as much as she went back to, to um, Balak and, and others, it turns back to Abraham, the same way as King David, who goes back to Judah and back to Abraham. Now, any question, I'm here to answer. Okay, again, <clears throat> please raise your hand. Um, uh, okay, we have, oh, Jackie Schaefer. Um, please, Jackie, please, go ahead. Jackie? Jack, Jackie, I, okay, I, I unmuted you. Oh, no. Is oh, Jackie? Hey, Liz. Yeah, um, that, I actually just was asking, I was trying to ask you a question before this started um, to see if you can give me permission to record the video. But, so never, yeah, 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 never, sure, sure, you can record. No problem. Um, it's okay now, but thank you. Okay, um, we, we had a question that was emailed to me um, uh, beforehand about uh, what, what does the Book of Ruth teach us about conversion um, that oh, might apply sure. to, to modern day? Um, conversions, and um, I know you, you you started to speak about that a little bit. Okay, so in general, anyone who comes to us and asks to be part of Jewish faith, he or she needs to have some foundations. And in order for us to um, determine if the person is a sincere candidate, um, we need to go to a process which called by Rabbi says three, three stages which means uh, we try to know the motivation and the reason why a person wants to go to that route. And the dynamic between Naomi and Ruth in the original story gives us the springboard and the foundation um, to know the uh, sincere intent. I humbly can say that in, the, um, in this book, 
I try to uh, give the person the foundation and after he or she will read it once, twice, three times, I think they have the foundation to um, the future plans. Um, I do know that many colleagues uh, recommend this book and other books like uh, Table Talk and other books I wrote for uh, people who wants to be part of Jewish faith because my attitude is a very um, basic to give people the foundation so they'll be able to go to the next level. But here and there I um, penetrate some Kabbalistic concepts and other rabbinic teachings the idea of simplifications to make it easy for people to read. And, and could you speak specifically about the types of things that um, Naomi warned Ruth about and whether, you know, about converting, you know, you know, oh, she sure, 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 sure. So in, in the back and forth between the two, Naomi tried to tell Ruth, listen, there's no reason for you to be part of Jewish faith. You came from a, first of all, well-to-do family. And you're still in the age that you can have babies. So why bother to travel with old lady back to the land of people who Moabite and Israelite not get along, if you read the text, and to go to a strange place and and it doesn't make any sense. You go back to your parents' house and you meet another man and um, and you open a new chapter in your life, which all part, the other daughter-in-law, did. Naomi have two sons. Um, then when she saw that Ruth was sincere and persevere, she said to her, listen, even if he, I'm old in age, but even if I have a baby, you, are you willing to take a chance and wait another 15, 20 years until he's ready to have children, because there is a concept in Judaism that is called yibum, uh, which is a labyrinth marriage, the obligation upon a surviving brother to marry first, um, have the first choice to marry his um, uh, brother's uh, late brother's wife. Um, and in short, she get out of Ruth the concept that she really meant to be part of Jewish faith because of ideology and, and philosophy and belief and strong roots of belief by the truth of Judaism and no other materialistic or other a, a, a motivation. So um, from the, that dynamic of talk between the two, which you can read both in the text, in the Tanakh, in the Bible, or in my book, um, you can uh, understand this dynamic between the two. Um, I guess uh, if we have other questions, yeah, please please um, raise your hand because we don't have any others yet. But in the meantime, I guess I'll ask another one. Um, it's interesting. Just look around, look around, make sure that. Okay, no, no, no. I'm asking people to raise their hand. Uh, oh, okay. In order to. Because uh, I don't see everyone. Okay. Yeah, okay, but no, but there's a way of raising your hand. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, you, uh, Eugene, Eugene has a question. So, Eugene? Okay, please. Eugene? I'll un unmute. So, uh, I see Faith. <laughs> Faith, you have a question? I understand the story of Ruth, but what's the me key messages? Let's say two or three messages you want people to walk away from after reading your book. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so the first and foremost is the idea that Book of Ruth is not just another story. It's the, um, it's uh, in one level, perhaps um, uh, it's the prophet Samuel, the author of the Book of Ruth is the uh, political manifesto. It's designed to erase any doubt in the minds of uh, ancient readers about King David lineage um, and claim uh, to the throne. To modern days, the lessons uh, are more transcendent, which means that Ruth and Naomi suffer great tragedies and setbacks in their lives, as did the other uh, uh, protagonist, Boaz. Yet the Almighty has the plan for each of them, as he does for each and every one of us at the same at the time that Ruth gave uh, birth to Obed, she could uh, not anticipate that one of her descendants will become uh, the greatest king of Israel, King David, or that his son Solomon will be the builder of the first Jewish temple, or that uh, another of David's descendants will be one day 
become the, which we call the messianic uh, idea. But if the only thing we learn from the Book of Ruth is that life is fate and that uh, everything is in God's hand, we, uh, we are in a way missing the greatest lesson of all that is uh, that it is absolutely up to each and every one of us to make the world a better place for ourselves and others. And that the way we do this is through tikkun olam, becoming uh, partners with God in repairing the world. And uh, I think that's basically the core. Obviously, there is much more, but just try to give you the vignette. Um, yeah, well, I want, oh, oh, okay, we have a few more hands up. Uh, Charles Greenberg, oh, sure. Dr. Greenberg. Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, Charles. The question okay. I have is, uh, 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 Rabbi, yes. what adjectives would you use to describe the characters in the book? the three main characters, I guess, Boaz and Naomi and Ruth. Um, and what do they say and how do they behave and what, how would you characterize them and what is the message from their behavior towards uh, successive generations and the, uh, uh, and the Tanakh in general? What are they trying, what are the, what are the, the sages trying to tell us by... Excellent. Um, um, this is a absolutely great question the only thing is um, um liz told me i have 15 minutes uh, do i because this is a long one i don't mind oh no no keep going keep going it's fine it's a very it's great, 100% a great question because this is a long answer oh okay okay I, I try to be succinct and 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 short but you know okay so uh, the book of Genesis, um, I like to try from, uh, to start from there because you understand the answer from that uh, point. Um, the Bereshit, the Genesis, uh, teaches that after the Almighty created uh, heaven and earth and all uh, their array, he quote unquote formed man from the dust of the earth and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living thing. I'm sure that you remember that text from Genesis 2. So the idea is that the dust represents man's earthly, a physical nature. The breath of life that God blew into Adam's nostrils is, as the Kabbalah explains, God's own spirit, what we call the soul, in Hebrew, nefesh or neshama. And these two aspects of man, the earthly and the heavenly, the physical and the spiritual, the touchable and the untouchable, are often in tension with each other. So uh, if you go now to the opening verses of the Book of Ruth, we see those protagonists, those names of Elimelech, husband of Naomi, and the two sons, Machlon and Kilion. Uh, uh, you think that the leader of the Jewish community in Bethlehem, Elimelech, um, fled uh, from his uh, what? Yes. Hello. Hello. The, I heard some noise. Um, you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so, a leader of the Jewish community in Beit Lechem, Elimelech, fled from his home for the land of Moab, where it was a time of that everyone needs him. It was famine in the land of Israel. And he just, he forsake them. And there in Moab, the Melech died. Ten years afterward, the two sons, Machlon and Kilion, married the enemy's um, daughter. Then they married Moabite women. And they too died. And leaving no children, no heirs. And now the problem is that nobody carries the family name. So all these three men are basically the, uh, um, the core of the kind of personality that we can derive, how um, people put um, uh, his or her physical needs above all else. Later, when you see the Boaz and even Plony Almoni was unwilling to extend a hand to Ruth if it meant risking his inheritance to his children. Um, Jewish literature is rife with examples of people just the opposite of Elimelech, Machlon, and Kilion, and Plony Almoni, and individuals uh, for whom the uh, spiritual life is all encompassing uh, character like Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. However, a exemplified a third path that God 
has led out for us instead of our physical and spiritual natures uh, waging war with each other so it's possible to live um, with um, them in balance um, so now we go to your question about specific names so Naomi in her uh, story did not return to Bethlehem until she was sure that the famine has had ended and food was uh, readily available and uh, she encouraged her daughter-in-law to remain in Boab and return to their childhood uh, homes where all their needs will be met. Orpa, the uh, Hillian wife, did in the end agree to remain in Boab, but Ruth, Mahlon's wife, refused to abandon Naomi and insist on accompanying her to Beit Lechem. So it is difficult to imagine Naomi traveling back uh, to Bethlehem as an old lady by herself. But with Ruth's help, the two women um, enter and will be able to return to or to reach Israel. So obviously you see from their behavior and the pattern of character how Naomi, in a way, depended on Ruth to provide for her need. And in turn, Naomi imbued Ruth with the love of Judaism and shared with her practical advice to attract Boaz's attention and win from him the promise of redemption. Um, again, you need to read the whole narrative to understand the dynamic between the characters, but Ruth, in a way, knew that her mother-in-law needed somebody to accompany her on her return and to provide for her once they reached Bethlehem. So that is why Ruth went to glean in Boaz's field, which was very it's very not normal to see the story at night, how she, um, um, in one hand, recognized the deeper hunger in herself, a uh, longing for faith and holiness, and, and on the other hand, how um, eventually she did what she did, which is to go at night and approach him at night and, and more. So also the Boaz, as um, we learn, um, buried his wife on that uh, very day that Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem, yet he continued his vigorous leadership of the Jewish people and continued to reach out to the poor and welcoming Ruth to glean in his fields and promise Ruth that he will redeem her as he ultimately did. So all these three characters, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, cared and um, sustained each other. Uh, uh, they were a molded of proper tikkun olam to the people on their day and continue to inspire the Jewish people of every generation to repair the world. And you can say furthermore, they ensured that the names of those who had gone before them, the Elimelech, Machlon, Kilion, who live on, that their souls finally will be at rest. So uh, you can go and say that the, the big uh, lesson from all those names is just as the Almighty God uh, implants his spirit into a person when he or she is born, it is said that God uh, draws his spirit out of the individual upon his or her death. So, and once the neshama or the soul right, is uh, completed its mission on earth, it can return to God. And the more good a person does on earth, the more deeply he or she will come to God and the closer that he or she to be with God, which is called uh, Olam Abba, the world to come. So I just gave you a long answer to your question just to show you the protagonist and its important as uh, individual. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, l l let me ask about another aspect. I see Tanya raise, raise her hand. <laughs> Daniel, right? Right. Um, let me ask you about another uh, aspect of the book while we wait for other people to raise their hands, which is um, that how Eli Malik leaves Israel, you know, during the famine, and then Ruth comes back. Does does this make um, does does the story really tell us anything about you know whether it's okay to leave Israel at certain times, or you know whether you know people should have stayed? Uh, whether Excellent the question. Family should have stayed? Excellent question. Um, I'll make it short because I, I don't want to go on and on with time. Um, people are busy. Um, in general, the rabbis tell us in the Talmud that one should not leave Israel only if it's one of the three 
a rare um, a circumstance. Um, one of them, it's if it's a famine, and the problem with Elimelech, it was a famine, but he was very well to do. That's the claim that he basically should be the last one as a well-to-do individual and as a judge should be the last one to leave and forsake his people. But you can match the current events and certain leadership of people um, in the modern Israel to the pattern and behavior via negativa to those people very easily. Can I ask a question? Um, yes, sure. Who, who is, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I have some people raise their hands first. Who's that, Steve? I'm raising my hand. Oh, okay. All right, Steve. And then I, ha and then I have Tanya and uh, um, I think one other person. Joe? Uh, Ayal? Oh, wait, I have a few people who've raised their hands now. So, uh, Steve, go ahead. Steve? Oh, okay. All right, I'll go on. Okay, Ayal Levitt? Hi, Ayal. <laughs> Hi. 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 Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear I me? Can hear okay. Yeah. So, so my, my question was uh, uh, something that was uh, bothering me or was interesting how the Bible is looking at it. If he's marrying a Moabite uh, woman, and we know that the Moabites had come from a sin, the sin of Lot uh, having slept uh, after he was drunk with his with his daughters, daughters. Uh, right? So, so how does that re uh, play in, and is that a sign that no matter the sin, that uh, future generations can correct it, and you can still become the Messiah? from uh, genealogy Excellent like that? Excellent question. Again, I try to be as succinct as possible because this is an excellent question to deserve a long answer, but I make it in a very, very, very short. It's hard, but I'll try. In very short, the idea of a conflict between two biblical texts, one tells us that um, children should not pay for the mistakes of the parents, and parents should not pay for the sin of their children. Each should be uh, punished accordingly. That's in the book of Deuteronomy. However, in the book of Exodus, they say that the Almighty God, after the golden calf, hold punishment for the second and third generation, which ostensibly it is some type of contradiction. Ezekiel, in his uh, well-known writing, he was also a priest and a Talmud, explained to us that it's all depend upon a person's behavior. So if you have a grandson of Nazis that he totally changed or she opposed the behavior of their parents and grandparents and show um, that they are different, uh, the punishment that reflects upon the sin of the parents will not impose on them. However, if the children who continue the pattern of the parents, uh, then they can get, in our simple language, anthropomorphically, uh, punishment um, that the parents um, uh, uh, misdeeds. But um, in, in a very general understanding, we as individuals have the capability, based on the Book of Ruth, to change our lives. Every day we kind of born again. And every single day we have a golden opportunity to make the right choices that lead in a small scale to have a better day and in a large scale to change our lives and life of others. So um, um, that's the short answer to a long question. To a Beautiful. Um, I guess uh, next, Wendy Honigman, and then after that, Tan Tanya, and then Joseph. Wen Wendy? Could the, um, I, I know that this is more or less an allegory, but when, after Eli Melech died, could the play, could the famine have gone on that long that Ruth and her sons didn't go back to Israel? It, it, it sort of seems like, yeah, they left because they were starving and they left for a better life. But then once the, the famine was over, they could have gone back before they became entrenched in the community. Before I promise you, I promise you, if you read my book, you have the answer. Oh, okay. You can tell, you can tell us. <laughs> yeah, tell us. Tell us. <laughs> Again, um, 
I try to do it in a very short way. Um, it's a combination of two things. Number one, one of the things that quote unquote, um, we blame that character is as a role model, as a leader, as a judge, he should not leave the country, especially not when they are in a great need and crisis. Two, even he left, and he left not just leaving, he left for the enemy, when the circumstance change, they should change, and instead uh, they assimilated in such a level that even their children, not just marry Moabite, but marry the daughter of the king of Moabite, and more. So it's kind of a lingering the theme that caused the death of the children. Um, again, it's mind-boggling question that um, we need to understand the mindset. Um, some say that Elimelech was a good, righteous um, individual that just failed to greed. And unfortunately, you can find in the modern days a lot of people that have that character, that is Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, that he is a good person that helping the community and helping other people in, in need, but when he's afraid that his own fortune may be taken from him, he all of a sudden turn his back and run away from his responsibilities. Um, I understand that, but he died, and there is a widow with two sons. Why but, didn't but the two she sons, go back? The two sons were um, set up with their wealth of the in-laws, who is the king of Moab, and it wasn't a reason for them to live the convenience life. If you read the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, it was just an example when the Jews expelled from the land of Israel after 410 years of the temple, and they are in Babylon. It's heartbreaking in story how Ezra and Nehemiah, which is the very end of the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, two leaders try to convince the Jewish community in Babylon, who was well established, to go and return to Israel and use the special permission that the king of Persia allowed them and, and, and rebuild the second temple. And Ezra and Akamiah described how, oh, we hold this fear against the Samaritans in one hand, and we, we only get the check, which means literally, um, and, uh, they went to those well-to-do people and they said, here is the check, leave me alone. I don't bother to ascend to Israel or bother to fight a war, or bother to build another temple. I'm comfortable, whatever I am. It's no different now. Yeah. Many rabbis say that it's deja vu and the history just keep repeating itself. Right. Um, next is Ta Tanya and then after that, Joseph. Yeah. Do you hear me? Ta yeah. Tell me, I have 15 minutes, please. What? Yeah. Um, uh, I wonder, okay. uh, and Ruth gave, you know, an incredible uh, lineage. Yeah, that's, um, uh, but I wonder, descendants of Ruth, and especially Tsar David, did he experience any problems being a grandson of a convert? Sure. The Talmud, again, you have to read my book. <laughs> I um, put a, 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 the tamtit, the synopsis of the Talmud that described the difficulties that uh, David went, uh, not just David, let's go back. Samuel, who wrote the book of Ruth according to the Talmud, went through um, the whole idea of uh, proposing after King Saul, a king um, of, um, that was a descendant from a convert was a question those days. And Talmud described how some opposed like Doeg and others, and it turned so nasty and so bad that um, someone stood up with a sphere with a big knife and said, anybody who doubts David lineage will going to be killed. Um, um, in those days, the, um, the lineage of David was questioned because of Ruth. Uh, many rabbis hold, many men, including ultra-Orthodox, that the whole purpose of Samuel writing this book is to clean the air and clean the lineage of David and his right, because all the Jewish prayer books and the book of Psalms and so many more is based on King David. And if you tell me that the conversion is, is illegal um, so, or immoral, so 
you, you, you challenge the whole core of Judaism. And that's the reason why um, the Talmud said Samuel decided to write this book. One of the reasons, or the key reason. Great question, Great question Tanya. Um, yeah, excellent. Excellent question. Uh, J Joseph? Joseph? Uh, yes. Um, uh, my question to you is based on your uh, previous, uh, just previous answer now about questioning uh, David's lineage. Uh, based on that, uh, two, two points I want to make, uh, two questions actually. How would, um, how would Ruth fare in today's, um, uh, in today's rabbinical courts as far as getting converted today? And also, uh, based on questioning um, uh, David's lineage, there is a concept in uh, Jewish law called Zera Yisrael. How come that's not used that often? Okay, so um, it's a good question. I, again, I answer in the book, but I, I give you the, just the abbreviation. Um, the question number one is, today, unfortunately, there is a lot of politics, and it's a lot of um, um, other motivations that involve with some of the rabbinic quotes. And this is one of the things that um, I really hope that will change. Um, but um, obviously there is a lot to rectify. Um, the question that come up constantly is who is Jewish and who is the right to convert and what's the right process and more is uh, based on that ancient question. Um, so obviously there is no clear cut answer to this question, almost like saying, depend whom you're asking, which who, who is the bet din or the rabbi you ask the question. Um, hopefully one day it will change. Uh, as far as the Zera Israel, this is uh, almost like Kabbalistic question. It's the, you're asking about the core, the lineage. Um, I can refer you to some books that are dealing with that, but in very, very short, uh, in my last chapter of the, my book, I, I expand on that a little bit. But uh, you see in my uh, uh, bibliography at the very end, I sent you to several uh, writings that are dealing with this question. Thank you. Okay, um, Steve Feldman, did, did you have a question before? I, I didn't see your hand up, but I thought you were asking. Asking something. All right. Um, we are. Uh, does anybody else have a question? We are. Um, we have. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Or let me just check the chat. Okay, so I'm free to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I, I, I want to thank you very much, and you know, I, I really. Sure. Uh, For you, Liz, I'll do everything. <laughs> you know, and you know, I really, just... I deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate it since I was. Rabbi Napolis, I know you for almost two decades, and I remember you coming to my previous shul and talk to a large crowd, and you really devoted your life for everything uh, um, for, the, for Israel and for the future of uh, uh, humanity and Jewish people in particular. I want to bless you and everyone um, that this uh, sadness and this virus and this uh, situation will uh, dissipate soon and the only good things uh, should happen to all of us. No, I, I wanna, I'd, like to, I'd like to just thank everybody and for being on the call. Sure, and, sure, and sure. You, and if you want to get the book, you know, you can contact Liz or me or Amazon or whatever. Yeah, the book, the book is very good. It's a question answer format. You know, I, I've been reading it and it's uh, you. very clear and answers, you know, many, many questions. You know, it's a question and answer format, which is very, very nice and very, very uh, easy reading. Um, I wanted to mention the uh, our upcoming um, book club uh, next week. We're going to have um, Identity and Prejudice okay. by. Uh, I can go. Uh, oh, oh, sure, sure. Thank you yeah, so bye much, bye. Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, bye, -bye. Just wanted to tell to tell people what, about what's coming up uh, uh, next week. I think it's um, on the next Thursday uh, at one o'clock, the twenty third. We're going to have Identity and Prejudice by Farrell Block, and it's very interesting. His theories of um, prejudice and. He's especially going to speak about anti-Semitism and the roots of anti-Semitism. Um, and he, he's a, a former Princeton, now retired uh, professor from Princeton, um, knows Mort for many years. Um, and he, he, I, uh, yeah, I've been reading that book too, very fascinating. 
Um, and then the week after that, we have um, the Oslo Syndrome uh, here, which is a classic book from 2005 by psychiatrist Ken Levin, uh, who was uh, actually on our slate. He's the husband of, the, um, of Andrea Levin, who's the uh, president of CAMERA. And uh, it's the full name is Os the Oslo Syndrome: Delusions of a People Under Siege, and he uh, speaks about um, the tendency of many people in, in the Jewish community to think that concessions work, and what's the psychological and historical root of that. Um, and you know, it's obviously very problematic. Um, and your know, fascinating book, which is of course still very very relevant today. Uh, and then I don't have a copy of the book yet, but uh, the week after that, on May 6th, we're going to have uh, Ilya Fiotis, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name, Fiotistov, um, and along with Charles Jacobs, a big activist from Boston, speaking about uh, the Islamic, uh, you know, start, starting, starting with um, the Boston massacre, uh, you know, the Boston massacre, and, and he's focusing on what what has happened that what happened at the uh, Islamic mosque uh, in Boston, and sort of how uh, is you know this very uh, radical uh, uh, fundamentalist Islam, um, which led to the massacre, has spread in Boston, um, and sort of a case study on that, um, which also should be fascinating. That's a brand new book. And uh, really looking forward to seeing all of you there and if anybody, you know, hope, hope and praying that everybody stays safe and please, uh, you know, everybody, I hope you pray for all the people who are, or, you know, who had the virus. I just heard um, uh, that uh, if a member of our Long Island uh, ZOA community's brother is extremely ill, might not make it. Um, if anybody wants to pray for him, it's Daniel, Daniel Nyken is the, the uh, young man's name. Um, and uh, he's the brother of David Nankin, who's a member of our Long Island uh, uh, ZOA community. And you know, just pray for, I hope we'll pray for everybody who's been struck by this and everybody else stay safe. And thank you so much for joining us again. Thank really. And then, any, anybody else want to say anything? Or <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please join, you. please join us in the next couple of meetings. Thank you. And send your suggestions to send if for any future meetings. And, and books. Um, Thank you. Bye bye. Can you can you tell me the date of the um, of the Oslo syndrome? That's going to be the 29th. Wednesday the 29th. The 20, Wednesday the 29th. Wednesday. All right. So none of these are, are are on Monday anymore. No, no. We had conflicts in the next couple of Mondays. Um, and then that's going to be Wednesday, the 29th, and the um, the the one about the uh, Islam in, in Boston uh, is going to be on um, uh, May 6th, yeah, also Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday, May 6th. We'll you know what? Around. Okay, but they're all at one o'clock. One o'clock. Yep. Okay. And you know we've had Thank requests you. to have them in the evenings also, so we may in the future also have some evening meetings. But thank okay. you, everybody. Thank you so much. I hope you thank enjoyed you. today. Thanks.